Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Mountain Preacher in Jesus podcast coming to you from the great city of Spokane, Washington. I love it up here. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm excited. I'm starting a new podcast series. I'm actually starting a couple new ones, but um, this one is going to be all about Does God Stand with Israel? The book that I wrote, published this last summer, I think it was um, July 2024 when it got published on Amazon. Um, there's a lot to this, and I want you to hear my heart in the reason I, I'd have a book entitled, Does God Stand with Israel? Because if you're sitting there right now and you're a Christian, you're probably going, well, duh, he does, obviously. But does he? Does he currently, or does God stand with the current state or country of Israel? And I'm going to propose that question to you. Uh, I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to argue. Um, I'm here to try to give you, to the best of my ability, from my studies over literally 35 years of studying um, both sides of the issue when it comes to dispensationalism, a, a different end time approach to theology, what all that means. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus, then I believe that you should wholeheartedly look at different uh, venues and avenues of theology when it comes to end time stuff. I believe there's so much stuff out there that is absolute um, fear mongering stuff that's not in scripture. For example, you're, you hear these phrases all the time, seven year tribulation, God's going to come and rapture his church out, the Gentile church out, which again, there's no such thing as a rapture of a church and then a seven year tribulation. Neither one of those are actually found in scripture, but as a Christian, you hear that stuff all the time. What about the mark of the beast? What about the antichrist and all those different things? All those things are designed to scare you, to freak you out, to uh, put you in this state of mind, like, oh my gosh, God's going to come back tomorrow. Um, I, I better be ready, all those kind of things. But yes, we better be ready for Christ. Yes, Jesus is going to come back. We don't know when. Um, but all the things I'm going to talk about in this book, I want to show it to you one more time. It's Does God Stand with Israel? It is on Amazon. It is, uh, you could buy it today. Here's the difficult thing about the podcast that I'm going to be doing is that I'm going to methodically go through this book probably one to two to three podcasts per chapter. So I hopefully you get the book and you could just start reading through it with your study. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm just being honest with you and showing you my heart. I've been all over the map in 35 years on what I believe and why I believe stuff based on my own study, uh, based on obviously the study of uh, what theologians believe and why they believe it. And all, you know, not all of them, but certainly a lot of them out there over the years. Um, and I would, uh, just a personal story, I would, when I would really dig in and, and study the Bible, especially like Revelation and Matthew 24, which I talk a lot about those things in this book, um, I would study Matthew 24 and, and Revelation and other parts of Scripture, Daniel, that, would, that I would come away in my own study without reading anybody else's stuff going, well, I'm convinced that most everything, and especially in Revelation, has already happened. Almost all of chapter 24 in Matthew has already happened. It seems that way based on what I read. Then I would hear a sermon or go study a dispensationalist, and they would be like, well, wait a minute. They're, they're completely disagreeing with what I just read and saying, uh, you know, what do I do? How do I do? And, and finally about, I'm 57 years old now. Again, I've been a Christian for about 38 years. And um, finally, about 20 years ago, maybe more like 15 years ago, I finally came to a point of view. It's like, okay, this is what I believe based off of what everybody that I've studied, all the theologians out there, what I think scripture says. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're really supposed to dig in and we're supposed to be Bereans and really study out the word. And what does it really say? And why do we think it says that? And all those kind of things. So I became a, um, you, you can call it an amillennial, um, and basically what I believe is that 
um, in the time of Jesus, when in the Gospels and that generation that was the most of the books of the New Testament were written between the death of Jesus and, and 70 AD. There was about a 35, 40 year period there. And again, I'll use some rough estimates there because I don't want to get exact, but basically 35, there was basically a generation where you know most of the New Testament was written. And uh, I firmly believe, based on again, that I could, I think, pretty easily prove what I wrote in the book that uh, all the way through the first 34 verses of, of Matthew 24 are, already happened in that generation. Um, Jesus did come back in 70 AD. Um, and I'm going to show you in scripture, it's so plain, it's so easy to see, just like he came back a few times in the Old Testament to destroy certain cities or certain regions or certain countries. And now almost every time the language in there, God would use another army of some sort and himself to destroy a certain other army or city or, or region or country, whatever you have. And again, I use all these scriptures in the book. It's really easy to see once you actually see the language and, and the language in the Old Testament and the New Testament and how they connect and how they combine to each other. But I'm going to start out with this. And again, if you're just going to listen to the podcast, um, you'll definitely get a lot out of it. I recommend go get the book so you could actually go through the book at your pace, then listen to the podcast. And listen, I encourage you to listen to other people and people that disagree with me, all that kind of stuff. I'm not trying to say that I know everything because I certainly don't. Um, but I just want to encourage you to get the book. Does God Stand with Israel? With my name, Van Bradeen. Again, thanks for being here. This is Mountain Preacher in Jesus. I want to just welcome you. Um, I can go on and on with an introduction. It's just, I don't want to bore you, though. I do have an email that I want to encourage uh, to write back and forth if you have questions. Um, vanbradeen at gmail.com. Vanbradeen at gmail.com. Um, I'm all about discussing uh, in, a, in a loving way, uh, talk about theology and, and so forth. Um, my goal in this whole thing is a few goals, but one of the major ones is that I would fully understand what I believe and why I believe it. Um, yes, I want to teach people that. There are many people out there that believe the same thing, far smarter than me, far more degrees than I have, um, that believe the same stuff that I believe. But um, probably the main goal, though, is I I want to get Christians to do their job and stop talking about end times. If you hear my voice and you're the person that goes on Instagram or whatever and starts talking about wars and rumors of wars, and those are the signs of the end times, I, I just want to say, stop it. You, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, in Matthew 24, again, I go over the whole chapter. Um, I want my goal, my ultimate goal is this, to get Christians to stop talking about those things that happened 2,000 years ago. Yes, they're going to happen again. Yes, they happened 50 years ago. Every generation has experienced wars and rumors of wars. Why all of a sudden do we freak out if there's a war and a rumor of war? Every generation thinks that their generation was the time that Jesus was going to return. Let me ask you as a Christian, why do you even care when Jesus returns? Why do you want Jesus to return? Now, do I believe he is going to someday? Yes. No one knows the time or the hour. We all agree on that. Uh, he is going to return. I, not all Christians agree on that. They think he already has. Uh, he definitely came back in 70 AD. The scripture talks about that. But that wasn't his end coming or what we would call his second coming. But that certainly was a time where he came back, which we'll see. I can prove that in the scripture and also in the Old Testament. So it's not like it's a, a mystery or anything. But what I want people to get, what I want Christians to do is quit talking about end times, because most of you, you have zero clue what you're talking about. Um, and do your job as a Christian. Go get somebody saved and discipled. That is your job. Your job is not to warn people and put fear in Christians. Oh my gosh, go sell all your stuff. You know, 2000, the end of the, the millennium, Jesus is going to come back, the year 2000, go buy. There's always fear mongering that goes along with end time theology. And there should be zero fear when it comes to us Christians. 
Now, I want to say this, and it's um, hopefully it, I can make it make sense, but hopefully it cuts to your heart as well. I hate this, okay? This is just a pet peeve of mine. Our job as Christians is to love people like Jesus loves people. Here's what I hate from dispensationalists. I'm not saying the person, but what I hate what they say is, well, you better turn right now or you're going to burn. You get better, get better punch your card. You better get ready because Jesus is coming back next week. You know how many people have been saying that over the last 2000 years and you're still saying that you sound like a broken record. And again, you have zero clue what you're talking about. And your focus is talking about end times when 100% of your focus should be loving a lost world and making a disciple of Jesus. Now, again, let me say it this way. When I hear a dispensationalist, which someone who believes in this a tribute, a rapture of the church and a seven year tribulation, and then God's going to come back a thousand year reign, all that kind of stuff, which is just all that's just not about the end times, which again, I prove that in the book, your heart really isn't to go love people and be like Jesus. Your heart is just to say, well, turn or burn, baby. Jesus never, I mean, obviously we believe that Jesus talks about hell and lake of fire. He talks about eternity. Yes. But Jesus loved those people dispensationalists who just say, man, you better get your act together because, man, he's coming back any time. You're going to hell. There's no love in that. Love is when you go out to the lost people and you get them saved because you love them. You tell them about Jesus, and then you sacrifice your life to make disciples of those people. That is what we're called to do. So that's my ultimate goal in writing this book, is that we as Christians would quit talking about end times, quit talking about stuff that we have no clue anything about, and just be Jesus to a lost and dying world. That is my heart. That is my passion. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, again, go buy the book, Does God Stand with Israel? Get your Bible, get three different translations get all your notes, get all your study, and just begin to go through it methodically. And hopefully you will see what I'm going to present to you. This is chapter one, episode one, in Does God Stand with Israel? Mountain Preacher coming at you from Spokane, Washington. All right, let's dig into chapter one. <clears throat> I have two episodes in chapter one. And here's the, the uh, beginning of the book is this. In chapter one, God has always had one plan. Now, right away, if you're a dispensationalist, you believe that God has a plan for a Gentile church. God has a plan for Israel and the Jews. They're separate. They've always been separate. All these different kind of things. And I'm just going to say, no, absolutely zero, nada, zero. God has always had one plan for all his people all the people of faith throughout the world, Jew and Gentile, have always been in one plan. That plan starts in Genesis, ends in Revelation. There's no bumps. There's no, oh, the Godhead had this plan. They put it together. Plan A failed. So they had to do this next covenant and all these different things. And plan B is in place now. And oh, here's the Gentile church, and and there, you know, it's going to come to a fulfillment someday, and God's going to rapture that church out so he can come back and deal with his real plan, which was Israel. I'm just telling you right now, none of that's in Scripture. It's not scriptural at all. It's not the heart of God at all. God has one plan. I'm going to read something here about dispensationalists. They teach a dual covenant where Israel has had one covenant with God, and the church has another covenant with God. This is where they get their false theology of God rapturing the church and then coming back to deal with Israel. But it is clear in Scripture that there is no rapture of the church and no hint of a seven-year tribulation. It is just one plan from beginning to end with Christ. In Ephesians 1 and 3, Paul emphasizes the concept of God's plan particularly regarding the unity of believers and the role of Christ in salvation. Let's break it down and go over some key points here. Again, how many times have you heard seven-year tribulation? 
If you believe that because you've heard that, I'm challenging you right now to encourage you and challenge you to go and email me where scripture talks about a seven-year tribulation. I'm going to help you and tell you that you won't find it in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, and you will never find a seven-year tribulation in the Bible. Dispensationalists have to take the word of God. They have to separate it, pull it apart. Then they have to put their stuff in there, then crunch it all back together. And then after they add stuff to the Bible or or twist scripture all sorts of different ways, then all of a sudden they say, well, okay, it's right here. Look at this. Well, I'm just telling you, it's not in there. So Ephesians chapter one, verses nine and 10 says this. Here, Paul talks about, I'm going to, sometimes I'm going to read what it actually talks about. And then sometimes actually the actual scripture itself. But again, uh, Ephesians chapter one, Paul talks about God making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ Jesus. This passage underscores God's plan being centered on Christ amid aiming for unity in all things. This concept will be defined more and more as we go through this book. But the important thing to understand is that Christ and his church, Christ and his church have always been the plan from the beginning, in the middle, the death and resurrection of Christ, and in the end, when Christ returns, all focus is on Christ, not modern day Israel. Now, I said a couple things in there that are important. Um, to understand that Christ and his church have always been the plan. When I say that right away, because of the terminology, you think New Testament church. Um, that's certainly part of it. But Christ and his church, let me rephrase it as Christ and his faithful ones, or God and his faithful ones, or God and his remnant, the people that have always been faithful to him from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to crunch all those together because that's exactly what God's church is, his people. So take out the word church because right away you think the New Testament church is different than the, the nation of Israel and the Old Testament and all this kind of stuff. The church of Jesus or the church of God have, has always been in Scripture, and it's simply this. And we're going to cover you know, the Abrahamic covenant in depth, Mosaic covenant in depth, the Davidic covenant in depth. We're going to cover all those things. Right now, I'm paraphrasing some things to get to the specifics toward the middle of the book, but God has always had one plan, which we're going to see here in a minute. That plan has always been his faithful people or his remnant. Just like today, there is a remnant in the earth, which is called his body, his church, and that is made up of people that are Jewish background in all Gentile backgrounds. They are one people. They're not separate. And God doesn't have a plan for Gentiles different than he has a plan for Jews or Israel. So that's what I'm getting at. It's all one plan. Ephesians 1 verses 22 says this, uh, Paul describes Christ as the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This reinforces the idea that Christ's central role in God's plan, bringing unity to the church. Ephesians 3, 6, Paul speaks of um, Gentiles being heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This highlights the inclusivity of God's plan, bringing together people from different backgrounds into one body through Christ Jesus. Again, always been one plan, which we're going to see here in a minute, this verse in Ephesians chapter 3 that's very, very clear and simple and something you just can't argue with. Um, in Ephesians 3 and 10, Paul discusses God's intent that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, let me just slow that down a minute. Through the church, 
God is going to share his wisdom to the world through his church. That's always been the case. You go back in the Old Testament and you go back and read through there. Every generation in the Old Testament, there was a thing called the remnant. In other words, the true believers or the faithful, just like Abraham was. So in other words, there's always been a remnant of faithful people who love God. Those people today are no different than they were in the Old Testament in the sense they were faithful. They found faithful to God. So if you were, at, and we're going to get very specific into all this, just so you know, I'm not just throwing stuff out there, abstract things that I'm not going to get in depth with. But in the Old Testament, if you were an Israelite under the Mosaic Covenant, that doesn't mean that you were going to heaven. If you were an Israelite and did all the covenant and, and, and circumcised and all that kind of stuff, that still didn't mean that you were one of God's children. It meant that you were an Israelite. It meant that maybe you had the blood relationship with Abraham, but it didn't mean that you were faithful to God. To be a child of God means you got to be faithful to him, which again, Abraham is our bi biggest example. We're going to cover him a lot in this book. Abraham was faithful to God. He believed God. Matter of fact, he, uh, not Ephesians, but Galatians, I believe three, we're going to get into that. The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached to Abraham 2000 years before Christ. If I'm not, I might be a little bit off on the numbers of the years there. But before Christ, when Abraham was, the God preached the gospel to him, and he believed it, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham believed God, and he was saved. He was born again, just like we are today. So Ephesians 3, 10 through 11 again. God's wisdom, how is God's wisdom going to be displayed to the earth? Is it Israel? No. Is it um, a denomination of a Christian church? No. All of God's people, his church, his complete church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose. So the church is going to demonstrate God's wisdom to all authorities earthly and heavenly authorities, um, demonic and angelic, I believe. Um, uh, there probably some people disagree, disagree with that, but I believe according to most theologians that I've read, they believe that's angelic and demonic forces, that the manifold wisdom of God is going to be shown to all authorities through God's church and that purpose he accomplished in Christ Jesus alone. But it was made known to them, and it was God's eternal purpose. So when God said it was his eternal purpose, that means from the beginning to the end, God's purpose has always been his faithful people. Whether you are Jew or Gentile does not matter one single bit. Jew or Gentile, as long as you were faithful. Now, clearly in the Old Testament, more of them were Jews than Gentiles because God was trying to use the Jewish community, the covenant with Israel when they were the nation in the Old Testament, trying to use them to display his goodness to the world, his, the gospel and so forth. They failed as a nation, which we get into. And then in Ephesians uh, 3 through 8 through 12, um, I just kind of want to go through that a little bit more detail. Um, verse 8. Paul acknowledges the grace given to him, even though he sees himself as least among the saints. Verse 9, Paul's mission is not only to preach the gospel or preach, but also to illuminate the fellowship of the mystery. So there's a mystery here. What is the mystery? We I think we all believe the mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So the mystery that the Old Covenant didn't fully understand, which we will get into more, the New Testament writers expose that mystery so we understand the mystery that it's always been Christ in us, the hope of glory. From eternity beginning to eternity end, it's always been Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is the mystery. The mystery is that there will be a crucifixion of the Messiah, 
He will save us from our sins, and that is the mystery that he is in us. In verse 10, uh, the purpose behind this revelation is profound. Through the church, God intends to display his wisdom to the celestial beings, good and bad, often interpreted as angels or spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. The church serves as a means for God to manifest his wisdom, his multifaceted plan to these celestial powers. Nowhere in the New Testament does it talk about Israel being God's eternal plan. As we will learn, Israel was chosen in the Old Testament to bring God's love to the nations, and they failed as a nation, and God divorced them as his chosen people or his instrument. But in God's redemptive plan, all Jews are still welcome into God's church. They've always been welcome, and they will always be welcomed. So through this book, you're going to hear some things that you're definitely going to question. You're going to go, what in the world is he talking about? But in no way, shape, or form am I being anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish in any way. The Jewish people, when they were officially became a people with Jacob, um, obviously there was no such thing as a Jew before that. God took um, Jacob and, and called his name Israel at that time, way back when, and but Jews today are fully 1,000% welcome into the body of Christ, which is salvation, but there's only one way in, that's through Christ Jesus. We're going to learn, and I go over this, many, many, many scriptures in the New Testament. True Israel, or a true Jew, is not someone who is born of Jewish, Jewish ethnicity. A true Jew or a true Israelite is somebody who has a relationship with God who is faithful to God. That is a Jew or a Gentile. does not matter your blood background at all. In verse 11, this display of divine wisdom through the church aligns with God's eternal plan, which he accomplished through Christ Jesus. Again, everything about this book, everything we should be preaching and displaying to the world is everything is in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ and him crucified is our answer to a lost and dying world. It's not Israel, it's not the Jews, and it's not a bunch of Gentiles. It is Christ, Jesus Christ, him crucified, and his followers or his church or his body, whatever, however you want to say that. In verse 12, through Jesus Christ, believers are have boldness and confident access to God through faith, this verse reaffirms the believer's position and privilege in Christ, emphasizing the role of faith as the means of assessing boldness and confidence. So I want to end this first episode. Again, I don't want to keep going down there. I want to I want to make these roughly 25 minutes to 35 minutes because there's a lot to it. There's a lot to chew on. There's a lot. This is brand new teaching for you. You're going to go, what in the world are you talking about? I, I thought there was a rapture. I thought there was a seven-year tribulation, and all this stuff freaks me out. I'm, I'm freaking out because God's coming back next week, even though I don't know if he's coming back next week, and people have been saying that for the last 2,000 years. So when is he actually coming back? Let me put you at rest. If you are a true follower of Jesus— you should have zero concern when Jesus Christ is coming back. You should have 100% concern, are you doing your job as a Christian? Your job is to love God and love people and go and make disciples. Zero concern whether God's coming back tonight or whether God's coming back next week or where, whether Jesus is coming back in 10,000 years. It does not matter to you. Matter of fact, I'm just going to throw something out at you, and I hope that you catch my heart. Why do you want Jesus to come back when there's billions of people that would go to hell tonight? Why in the world, as a Christian who loves God and loves people, would you want Jesus to come back tonight so billions of people go to hell? Hopefully you understand my question, and hopefully you understand my heart. The last thing we should want is for Jesus Christ to come back so we can get out of this place. Our job is to be in this place. Our job is to go out and love people and be bold and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Please hear my heart. We can disagree on theology. That doesn't matter one bit. What we cannot disagree on 
is our job as Christians is to love God and love people and go and make disciples. Are you focused on end time stuff and scaring people, getting ready for Jesus? Are you doing rapture practice and all those things that are just completely silly? Or are you 100% focused on God's will, which is to seek and save the lost and go out and make disciples of him? This is Mountain Preacher from Spokane. This is Mountain Preacher and Jesus podcast coming at you. Have a great day. Be blessed. We're going to go through this. Please go to Amazon. Buy this book, Does God Stand with Israel? Discovering true Israel and not the one that we look at over in the Middle East. True Israel is not a section of land. It's not a state. It's not a country. True Israel is every follower, Jew or Gentile, of Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the King of Kings. He died on the cross and he rose three days later that we might be saved. He is the head. His body is the church. And we are to go out and do his job. Thank you so much. Be blessed in Jesus' name.